Welcome back everyone to Pinpoint History. We introduced the leading players attempting to conquer England when we last left off. We have Harold Godwinson as the current King of England, the Norwegians led by King Harald Hadrada, and the Duke of Normandy, William. Jumping just right back into it. Harold Godwinson knew that if England were to be invaded by outsiders, it would come from the Normans. After his coronation, Harold began preparing to defend England from the Norman invasion. He led troops to the Isle of Wight, a small island south of England. The forces stayed stationed there for several months, but eventually returned back to the mainland in September of 1066. Meanwhile, the first invader of England would be Harold of Norway. I did not mention this in the previous episode, but Norwegian Harold would be supported by a man named Tostig. Tostig is the brother to the current King of England and was banished in 1065. Tostig was the Earl of Northumbria at the time the northern part of England, and notably where the Danelaw had been. Tostig was not a popular ruler in Northumbria, and he had been unable to make himself popular with his constituents. In October of 1065, the local aristocracy invaded York and killed Tostig's supporters within the city. King Edward sent Harold Godwinson to negotiate with the aristocracy to quell the rebellion. What it took to end the rebellion was people wanting Tostig out, and Harold recommended that to Edward. The result being, Tostig had his earldom relinquished, and he was named in exile shortly after when he did not agree to the terms. Tostig, feeling betrayed by his brother, left for Flanders. Tostig spent some time in Flanders before returning to England to raid the land. Eventually, he was defeated in his former earldom by the Earl of Mercia Edwin and the new Earl of Northumbria, Morcar. He fled to the Kingdom of the Scots, where he stayed for the summer. Here, some believe he got into contact with Harold of Norway and even sailed out to Norway. Whichever way it happened, when Harold of Norway set sail for England, he stopped at the Orkney Islands north of Scotland, where he was reinforced by Tostig. So now our Norwegian invasion begins. After linking up with Tostig, Harald now had a valuable ally in his invasion. Not only was Tostig the brother to the current king, but they were now invading the portion of England Tostig had been in control of only a year prior. Tostig knew the land, and he had a grudge. Harald began raiding the towns along the northeastern coast of England until they reached the Humber estuary. This estuary allowed the Norwegian fleet to sail into England proper. As the Norwegian forces sailed up to the city of York, they knew they would be unable to take the city. So they disembarked 10 miles or so from the city, and this time it was round two for Tostig, as the combined forces of Morcar and Edwin marched out to meet the invading force at the area known as Fulford Gate. The invading force of Norwegians numbered about 10,000 soldiers approximately. But Harold left a sizable contingent to stay with the ships as he marched up towards Fulford. Harold marched around with 6,000 soldiers. Meanwhile, the Anglo-Saxon forces numbered around 5,000, most being hastily drawn up from the Mercian and Northumbrian Firds. The Firds were local militias made up of free men who could afford to arm themselves, interspersed with small retinues of experienced soldiers from the Earl's personal households. The Norwegians met the Anglo-Saxons at Fulford Gate, approximately a couple kilometers away from the city of York. When they met at Fulford Gate, each armed force had a river to one side and swampy marshlands to the other, meaning the only way to retreat would be to go backwards. The forces now facing each other looked like this. The Norwegian left was led by Harald personally with his most experienced soldiers, and their Norwegian right was led by Tostig, with the mercenary forces he had acquired. Morcar arrayed his forces before Tostig, while Edwin faced Harald's forces. Morcar began the engagement by pressing forward toward Tostig. Early in the year, Morcar had been able to defeat Tostig, and was confident he could do so again. Morcar's forces crushed Tostig's and began pushing them back, overwhelming them. 
Harold pushed his troops forward across the river and decimated Edwin's forces. Harold's forces had been battled hardened over the last 20 years warring with Denmark. Additionally, Harold had a small contingent of men that had been with him since his days in the Varangian Guard. The fighting was hard, and after, Edwin's forces had been massacred and he retreated towards York. Harold then wheeled his forces around and crashed into the flanks of Morcar's forces, causing complete disarray. Morcar fled to York, but many of his soldiers were cut down. The initial battle between the Norwegians and English had been an overwhelming Norwegian success. Casualties ran high on both sides, with Harold losing a thousand men, about 10% of the army he came with. Manpower was crucial for Harold as the invader. He needed to preserve his fighting force as much as possible. The English lost around 1,500 of their initial 5,000 man force, 30% of the northern part of England's fighting force a fact that would haunt the English later on. The Norwegians moved quickly to capitalize on their victory. York quickly capitulated to Harold and agreed to swap out hostages to ensure their loyalty. Harold did not sack the city, probably because Tostig didn't want his former territory ransacked. Harold, now in control of Northumbria, focused on acquiring supplies to feed his army. They set up quarters around 11 kilometers east of the city of York at Stamford Bridge. Meanwhile, news of the Norwegian invasion reached Harold of England. There's just so many heralds to keep a track of. English Harold had disbanded his army earlier in the month and was now residing in London. After finding out about the Norwegian invasion, he was forced to recall his soldiers and moved on the Norwegian position. Harold pushed his army hard to catch the Norwegians by surprise, covering over 300 kilometers in five days. The English mounted many of his troops to cover ground, and they were aided by the old Roman roads. How's that for solid infrastructure? The English made it to Tadcaster, a few kilometers southwest of York, with the Norwegians completely unaware of their presence. The English forces were not far from the landing site of the Norwegians, with Harold and Tostig both there. However, they did not become aware of each other's presence. The next day, the Norwegians made a fatal mistake. Unaware the English had already arrived, Norwegian Harold and Tostig moved back to Stamford Bridge to gain supplies and exchange hostages. They took two thirds of their army with them, but notably, the Norwegian forces did not bring their armor to make it an easier march. The Norwegians made it to Stamford Bridge, unaware of the impending English assault. The English army, now well rested, moved on to York, marching through the city, meeting up with Edward and Morcar. The English army rolled up on the Norwegians, who were woefully unprepared, with the Norwegian forces split on the east and west banks of the River Derwent where Stamford Bridge was located. The English army numbered around 10 to 13,000, with 2 to 3,000 being cavalry. The Norwegians had 2,000 on the same side as the English forces, with the other 4,000 being on the other side of the bridge. The now approaching English army initially caught Norwegian Harold and Tostig by surprise. They didn't think it was the force of Harold Godwinson, as they didn't think Harold would be able to make it in the five days that had passed since the battle at Fulford Gate. To add a little bit of drama to the story, historians a couple centuries later added this story. A lone rider came up to Tostig and Norwegian Harold. Addressing only Tostig, he said if he defected back to the English, he would be given his earldom back. Tostig asked what Norwegian Harold would get for his trouble to which the rider said seven feet of English ground, as he is taller than most men. The rider then rode back to the English forces. Harold was impressed by the man's boldness and asked Tostig who he was. Tostig said it was Harold Godwinson himself. So, a little bit of spice to add to the drama of some brother-on-brother combat. We're getting a little Cain and Abel here. The battle began with the English pressing towards the bridge. Most of the Norwegians in the West Bank managed to cross back to meet up with the primary host. But if the English took the bridge, the Norwegians would be unable to set up formations. 
small contingent of Norwegians held the bridge long enough to allow the Norwegians to deploy their shield walled. There's even a story of a lone Norse soldier who held the bridge by himself. He killed 40 men on his own before the English sent a little boat underneath the bridge and stabbed the man in the groin. No honor. Time bought. The 6,000 Norwegians retreated to a high hill, able now to form the shield wall, and they were now capable of meeting the ferocious English assault. As an addendum, if you like heavy metal, you should check out the uh, Stamford Bridge song by Amon Amarth. They do a pretty cool rendition of this tale. The English cavalry pushed forward and assaulted the Norwegians' left flank. Both sides took massive casualties, and the cavalry retreated. The Norwegians went ahead, smelling blood in the water, charged furiously towards the English. The English infantry formed up and moved forward, meeting the Norwegians' berserker attack. The fighting turned bloody. The Norwegians, an expert fighting force, pushed the English center back. Harald Hadrada is alleged to have fought like a madman, killing everything in his path. Then, in an instant, the cavalry returned and hit the Norwegian left flank from the back, shattering them. Then, in the center, a flurry of arrows from the English rained down, catching Norwegian Harald in the throat, where he fell over dead. Tostig now took control of the remaining Norwegian forces and retreated back slightly, having the remaining forces assume a shield wall. Harald sent a missive to Tostig, asking his brother and the remainder of the forces to surrender. Tostig and the Norwegians declined, the Norwegians furious at the death of their king, and Tostig making his bed and deciding to lie in it. The English descended upon the remaining forces and made short work of their foe, and Tostig died in the fighting. The Norwegians were strong hand-to-hand fighters, but as the combat became incredibly bloody and became very hand-to-hand, the Norwegians' lack of armor proved to be the decisive factor and the reason why they were defeated. Just after Tostig and their remaining Norwegian forces were killed, 3,000 Norwegian reinforcements arrived at Stamford Bridge, fully armored and furious at the decimation of their kin. These 3,000 charged the English, and the English managed to turn and reform their lines to engage the last of the Norwegian army. The initial brunt of the Norwegian attack was heavy and they managed to push in, killing a lot of people. But in the end, the numbers of the English overwhelmed them, and they were also annihilated. Following this battle, Harold Godwinson marched towards the Norwegian ships and informed the few remaining soldiers that everyone was dead and that he would allow the small group of men to return home. After swearing oaths to Harold that they would not come back and reinvade, the invading forces left. Of the 300 ships that it took to bring the entire force here, it only took 24 ships for the small group of Norwegians to leave. As all of this occurred, the Duke of Normandy, William, was assembling his own forces. William had delayed his own invasion for a few reasons. One, he was looking for papal support to legitimize his invasion of England as England was also a sovereign Christian nation and, you know, fellow brothers in Christ and all that. William was able to gain the Pope's blessing through the usual Norman diplomacy. Norman diplomacy was usually enacted by flexing their muscles and taking what they wanted. And this was made much easier by the fact that there was a large contingent of Norman forces in southern Italy. Many Norman knights had left the Duchy of Normandy to make their own way in the world having served as mercenaries across all of Europe. Many had been hired by the Eastern Romans to help defend the remaining lands in southern Italy in the 1040s, but they began to engage in their own personal interests. The Normans were now in southern Italy, and they had a toehold in Sicily as well. The Pope had used the Normans as a counterweight to the increased influence of the Holy Roman Empire in the north, who held lands in northern Italy. The Normans in Italy basically forced the Pope to give his blessing to William. And lastly, William had to ensure all was peaceful in his duchy before leaving for what could be an extended period of time. He had his own fleet built, which was not finished until the end of August of 1066. At this point, Harold was still waiting for William's invasion, and as a result, 
William did not want to sail for England where his ships could be taken by surprise by the English fleet. When Harold returned back to the English heartlands and then went north to face the Norwegians, William had his chance. William and his forces set sail and arrived in England on September 28th, four days after Harold's battle with the Norwegians. Harold would typically be located in London was now hundreds of kilometers north of William's forces. The next showdown was set to begin. That's it for this week's episode. If you liked it, please leave a rating, hit that follow subscribe button so I can get validation from random strangers on the internet. Follow me on Instagram at Pinpoint History. Thanks for listening, everyone. Let's get it.